Suicide is a touchy subject, an eerie conversation, one that is often had after the deed has been done and it's too late. It's a rising epidemic amongst Nigerians today. It has been claimed by the authors of a study that on the average, more women attempt committing suicide, but a greater number of men actually succeed in carrying out the act. But does it really matter whether this is true or false? The alarmingly scary thing seems to be that the sanctity of human life is fast eroding and there has been a proportionate increase in the number of those who believe succumbing to suicide is a quick way out. Sadly, suicide in Nigeria is grossly underreported due to the sensitive nature of the subject because it is perceived as sinful a taboo caused, and a taboo caused by evil forces. The families are oftentimes stigmatized, so people prefer to hide the mode of death. How then exactly can one relate to the experience of an individual that attempts to take his or her own life and ultimately fails to accomplish the objective? How does such a person's life pan out thereafter? In Nigeria, for instance, where life from just every angle has become progressively a living hell for a lot of people. What's the story of those who at one time or the other attempted to end their own lives? Suicide is indeed on the rise and similar to the hell that establishes suicide contemplation, some survivors of suicide attempt endure harsher post-traumatic conditions internally and externally. Environment, laws, and other factors play a key role in preventing suicide and in helping victims of suicide. We really need to analyze historical, environmental, and health causes of suicide contemplation and how survivors can eliminate them. We need to analyze the chronic risk factors of suicide and how to strengthen our children against them. And we need to discuss the factors of love, unity, freedom, support, progress, and development that protect many citizens from the toxic process of suicide. We have two very special guests today who are strong and exemplary survivors of suicide attempt. They will share their experiences from contemplation, from the stage of contemplation to post-attempted suicide stage. What help did they get along the way? Do please stay tuned to hear more from them shortly. In the meantime, let's watch this special report by Arise's producer, Ikena Kingsley. Suicide. One of the major causes of death globally is the act of killing oneself intentionally. A lot of people believe suicide happens when the individual is under pressure of some sort. But that isn't entirely true as the decision to commit suicide can also be as a result of free will. Every year, over 700,000 people take their own life, and there are many more people who attempt suicide. Every attempt is a tragedy that affects families, communities, and entire countries, and has long-lasting effects on the people left behind. It can affect the health and well-being of friends loved ones, co-workers, and the community. When people die by suicide, their surviving family and friends may experience shock, anger, guilt, symptoms of depression or anxiety, and may even experience thoughts of suicide themselves. Suicide also affects all ages. In 2020, it was among the top nine leading causes of death for people between the ages of 10 to 64, and it was second leading cause of death for people between 10 to 14 and 25 to 34. Many factors can increase the risk for suicide or protect against it, and is connected to other forms of injury and violence. For example, people who have experienced violence, including child abuse, bullying, or sexual violence, have a higher risk of suicide. Being connected to family and community support and having easy access to healthcare can decrease suicidal thoughts and behaviors. Globally, it is estimated that around 20% of suicides are due to pesticide self-poisoning, most of which occur in rural agricultural areas 
and low and middle income countries. Other common methods of suicide are hanging and firearms. So, how do we reduce or prevent suicide? Knowledge of the most commonly used methods is important to devise prevention strategies which have shown to be effective, such as restriction of access to means of suicide. There are a number of measures that can be taken at population, subpopulation, and individual levels to prevent suicide and suicide attempts. Some include limiting access to the means of suicide. Also, identify early, assess, manage, and follow up anyone who is affected by suicidal behaviors. These need to go hand in hand with foundational pillars such as situation analysis, multi-sectoral collaboration, awareness raising, capacity building, financing, surveillance, monitoring, and evaluation. Suicide prevention efforts require coordination and collaboration among multiple sectors of society, including the health sector and other sectors such as education, labor, agriculture, business, justice, law, defense, politics, and the media. These efforts must be comprehensive and integrated as no single approach alone can make an impact on an issue as complex as suicide. I end this report by saying, suicide is preventable and everyone has a role to play to save lives. So, as we go about our daily activities, let's always be cautious of how we treat people and the words we say, because they might just be close to the edge. Ikena Kingsley, Arise News. You know, every time I always leave, leave a sigh after, after we see any of this, you know, mind-provoking, thought-provoking yeah. incident. And basically, what the underlying factor, I think what is most unbearable is the stigma. It's the shame, it's the guilt that loved ones of those who have committed suicide feel. It's the lack of pity from people when you hear about incidents mm -hmm. of families that have lost their loved ones to suicide. It's the incense and the fact that the government is not even drawing enough awareness. Because even when that's the case, the bereaved family would want the police to print a different report. Right. So instead of creating or creating, we need to create more awareness more about this incident and mm -hmm. understand that is a mental issue. Just because mm -hmm. it's not manifested physically doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And I, right. I don't think we should apportion blames to how the child was brought up or how mm -hmm. the person was brought up. If you didn't do this, you, you did it this way, this might not have happened. Suicide and mental illness mm -hmm. is a disease that needs to be given the attention it deserves. I agree. One of my questions for the guests coming today is who supported her in the process of recovering? And exactly. How how, you know, when her story went out, they had made headlines. Mm -hmm. Did government reach out to her? Who are the NGOs exactly. that said, look, yes. we can support you, we can fund you to help other victims? Mm -hmm. How has community supported this rise you have to, save those to reduce you have to save those questions because they will come, suicides in the they country? Will, they, will definitely, they will definitely come so in handy. They will definitely and I like come that handy. last picture that was shown on the VT. Yes, yes, yes. When yes, they showed... Yes, yes. Suicide, suicide going left yes, and, and support, support going right. right. Support is and such support a big... Support on the right, yes. It's a very big aspect of moving forward from suicide. Mm -hmm. I know, but I'm I'm looking forward to them because there's no I there's nobody too. there's nothing like talking to those who have actually worn the shoes. Mm, mm. And you know we're not going to finish here. Mm. I think our next episode on this suicide issue we will now talk of the loved uh, ones left behind. That's one because is that's a deep another one. entire that a deep uh, yes, one. that's another deep. Mm. So we can't even just especially you know, those that are lost close relatives. I have lost course. friends, and I know how yes, deeply yes, shattering that yes, was. But yes. those that have lost daughters, mothers, mothers uh, sons. So let's just focus on the ones that actually attempted it. Because right. I want to know what courage, what gave them the courage, mm -hmm. what made them, what pushed them over the yeah. edge to take. Because it's a very bold step to take. Yeah. Very, very bold step. We have two excellent examples today. And I'm oh, really we have, yes. And I'm happy. That's why I, I happy said it's too. better that we divided yeah. it. You I remember have those when we ones. talked about Emmanuel, you were all up for it. I was, like, okay, I was so excited. <laughs> I was like, no, no, yeah. no, 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 no. And of course, I've, been, I've also been accused of not addressing it 
in a sensitive manner because I posted something the other day mm. and was told that the image was too harsh. And I'm like, okay, yes, the image is harsh, but so is the reality. Why was the image harsh for those Well, because I, I posted somebody that, you know, the, the, the act of taking cyanide. Okay. Do you understand? Which, looking back, I thought, okay, maybe it was a bit insensitive. So I do apologize mm. to our audience if I did touch a raw nerve. But mm. my aim was to ensure that this message hits home. Mm -hmm. I wanted something that would evoke emotions. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad that that has mm -hmm. happened. But we're heading for a short break. But we're heading for a short break right now. But stay with us because when we return, it will be time to meet our esteemed guests, Emmanuel Amadou and Hawa Ojefo. Perspectives will return in just a minute. Joining us now to discuss surviving attempted suicide are two exemplary young people. Hawa Ojeifo, popularly known as the voice of mental health. Hawa is a dynamic survivor, now working extensively to bring succor to many of those who are in the zone of contemplating suicide. Hawa is executive director of She Writes Woman Mental Health Initiative. Additionally, she runs a 24 hours seven days a week, mental health helpline. We train counselors providing counseling to help victims of suicide attempts. We're also being joined all the way from Ohio, United States by Emmanuel Amadou, another survivor of attempted suicide. Emmanuel is a global change maker and an international award winner who has launched various initiatives in Africa, predominantly in Nigeria to share his sensational story of resilience and persistence while collaborating with other survivors and stakeholders naturally, natu nationally sorry, and internationally to restore hope to the seemingly hopeless. It's been great to have both of you here with us today. It's absolutely great to have you both here, Hawa and Emmanuel. I was just telling Mrs. Osime that we're Miss, excited. Have you married me? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. That we're excited to actually have you guys here today because yes. we've both read your stories and, and we resonated very deeply with your stories. Moving. We're happy to see you guys. Happy thriving and on perspectives today. Thank you. Thank you both for being with us. I think I'm going to start with you, Hawa. Because of the pervasive stigma of mental illness and suicide, it's often very difficult for people to admit they need help or to even be taken seriously. What drove you to attempt suicide? How did you try it? And what was the final straw that pushed you to the end? And what still, how did you feel when it didn't succeed? Hawa, can you yeah, hear me? Yeah, um, thank you so much for having me. Um, so first off, I think it's important for me to backtrack in terms of you know, the journey that led to it. First off, yes. I've had two near suicide attempts. And then I had a suicide, I um, actually had a suicide attempt. And, um, you know, it all started, you know, long, a long time ago. But my official diagnosis came in 2016 when I was diagnosed with bipolar and post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm. The post-traumatic stress disorder came from um, multiple instances and incidences of sexual violence that I um, experienced from when I was pretty young and um, even my adult life as well. And so um, it's important to set that stage just so that we have a bit of context. Um, living with suicidal ideation is something that I have had to go through, you know, the last couple of years. I would say it's been, I have managed my condition um, very well over the last, you know, couple of years or, you know, in the last five years at the very least. And um, just understanding stress, um, stressors. So whether those stressors are work related, you know, relationship based or, you know, and just sometimes, you know, not having the right access to the right combination of medications, therapy and social support can also, um, you know, lead, you know, people to, to the edge. And so for me, it was it was a very stressful period or it was a, it was an elongated stressful period because, of course, because I've lived with a mental health condition for a while, I have learned to cope. I have learned to take my medications, to watch my diet, to watch my physical, um, in terms of you know, exercise and things like that. I'm very particular about my sleep routines. I'm also very particular about what I consume. And that's not just what goes into my mouth, but it's also my ears, my eyes, you know, and things like that. I'm also very particular about you know, my space and my social support. And so, but the thing is, when you have severely stressful situations, 
you know, work stress, maybe a series of bad news, confusion, or you are in a, an abusive situation, really, you know, in terms of maybe relationship and things like that, it can, you know, in my own case, it really did push me over the edge. Okay, it was that thing that, you know, perhaps to other people, it was just... You know, oh, it's just a difficult moment. But for me, with pre-existing issues, with already accumulated traumatic life mm -hmm. experiences, it makes it predisposes me to, you know, um, imbibe or you know absorb the stressors of those situations. Because as we would know, um, you know, trauma literally rewires the brain. Wow. And so what people may think as, oh, no, that's just, a, that's just a, a life event. You know, you just get up and be stronger tomorrow. It mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily work like that for a mind and for a brain that has had to go through severe mm -hmm. trauma. Mm -hmm. And so in my own situation, I'm very delicate about the kind of stressors that, mm -hmm. you know, come my way. I have my family and my friends who are always on the lookout for certain things that could be, you know, triggers. Strong, strong you know, they may not know mm -hmm. what the exact trigger is, but they know that, okay, Hawaii is not sleeping as well or she's not eating as well well or she's staying in bed a little longer these are signs so how i talk to us what is going on what's going through your mind because it's not always evident as something physical within the environment it can just even the individual might not particularly know exactly just they can feel mm. the sensation that something is being triggered in them that is taking them plus right. back rather yeah. to you know um a traumatic life experience thank or you, the Howard. way they reacted in traumatic life experience thank you so that's much interesting. that was a deep in-depth it is answer that you just it gave. is you mentioned something that trauma stressful conditions actually rewires mm. the brain thank mm. you Hawa. um this next question is for you emmanuel for every soul lost to suicide there are millions of people who are researching and ideating suicide the World Health Organization recently classified suicide as a public health concern that requires urgent attention, with over 700,000 people dying by suicide annually. Please tell us today, concisely, how would you counsel someone ideating suicide based on your successful recovery? Consider me or my co-hosts being suicidal right now. Based on your experience, what words of hope can you possibly say to revert the situation? Manuel, is um, you... Thank you for the privilege. I, uh, first of all, I actually didn't uh, attempt suicide, but I actually had um, contemplations at points when I felt depressed and I, the situation that I was going through then was really traumatic which actually led to uh, contemplations and all that, but which I didn't um, actually commit suicide. But one thing I would actually want to tell people who are going through um, traumatic experiences and stress and um, difficulties and life uh, challenges is to um, make them understand that um, they are resources out there, there are people who care about them and there is hope for them no matter what they are going through. Um, and one thing I would emphasize is that um, they should endeavor to speak up, like speak up, reach up for help and mm -hmm. all that, yeah. yeah. Thank okay. you, Emmanuel. Emmanuel, I have, yeah. I have, are you done? Are you, have you answered um, my co-host's question? Yes, he said reach okay. out for help. When okay. And another thing that's, you know, like um, Olatura brought to our, our attention before you guys came on air is about the loved ones of those who attempt or who feel suicidal. Mm. Nobody is ever prepared for that role. Nobody psychologically, emotionally can handle it or even physically because how I just mentioned her, how she's constantly being checked upon. They, they, anytime they, they look at her, if they sense anything wrong, you know, they quickly call her, walk on her. The truth of the matter is, not a lot of people have that luxury of having people who can bend over backwards. Because other, other people are also dealing with their own issues. That doesn't justify not going the extra mile because you're dealing with somebody who has an issue. So what I want to ask is that how can people respond appropriately when a friend or loved one discloses a suicide attempt or harbors suicidal thoughts, apart from the usual inquiry about their welfare and any other pressing issues, what are the other key questions one can ask about a person's feelings to help screen them for suicide risk? And in what manner 
should these questions be asked without the recipient causing the recipient any alarm? Because people are also mm -hmm. sensitive. And as I pointed out, some people don't even know that they have these tendencies. So how do you broach the subject to make the recipient, the person, comfortable enough to confide in you? Okay, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, first of all, I would reflect on some of the projects which I, I did uh, collaborating with um, different team and stakeholders in Nigeria, especially in Kwara State. Uh, we were able to launch kind of mental health awareness and sensitization campaign, you know, across uh, 50 schools, like prior to the pandemic. And that was uh, pretty much like a route that we were able to kind of identify individuals who, uh, who are in need of help. Uh, because personally, based on my experience as one who has a viral story and having proofs to show, you know, to different persons to students from different high schools and all that like it's kind of gave them a sense of like um trust like they were able to kind of uh, gain trust in me based on what i've gone through and as a young person like them and that's actually made them um open up on their experiences and from there i was able to um, link them up with um, available resources non-profit mental health agencies that specializes in um, their needs, you know, because the first thing that is very important to note um, in being able to meet these needs is, first of all, identifying the needs. And I would also reflect on um, on my experience here in the in in the US. Um, prior to this time, I because currently I happen to be the student government president for one of the institutions in America. Okay, and yeah, and my zeal to always want to like meet needs of persons of young people actually mm. made, me, made me indicate interest like to to run for the office so okay. i can closely connect to to understand the needs and to also provide support where possible that's so that actually opened, that actually opened me to uh, a lot of um like it's actually made me understand a lot like identifying a lot of students that wouldn't have even reached out to counselors, persons who are going through traumatic experiences, um, suicidal thoughts, and mm -hmm. a lot that wouldn't want to reach out uh, personally. So those persons, I, I was actually able to talk to them and also like refer them to trusted persons, to resources available in the society. So what I'm uh, pointing uh, towards is, the the role of uh, persons the role of survivors and i know a lot of people actually considerate of uh, the stigma and that's mm -hmm. why they yeah they don't want to be involved because they don't uh, they tend to think about what people will say about their experiences and all that so but we actually need more persons to be involved just like my um, my other panelists Our, and, you yes. know, yeah. like that can actually sacrifice their experience and to gain trust in the mind of these people who are affected because trust is actually one of the uh, basic things that is being looked out for because persons who are going through traumatic experiences and suicidal thoughts or whatever, they need someone who they can trust enough. Yeah. They need mm. a story. Absolutely. Yeah, so, somebody that yeah. they're comfortable enough with. Right. Exactly. Right. To, 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 to. Thank you, Emmanuel. So that, yeah. We're proud of your story and we like how you're continuing to support people and serving okay. as a trust figure to people who are contemplating suicide. Howard, this Thank next you. question is for you. Different people have differing causes of attempted suicide, different treatments and differing journeys to survival. Therefore, the counseling approach at your laudable 24 hours hotline requires varying levels of expertise. Tell us, please, the structure within your hotline that caters to different degrees of callers. How do you divert situations above or beyond your control? How do you escalate critical suicide attempts? Feel free to give us an actual critical scenario and how your counseling hotline dealt with it. Thank you so much. Um, so yes, we do run a 24 seven toll free helpline. And um, when you call the helpline, you speak to trained counselors. Um, beyond the trained counselors, there is uh, an actual therapist that carries out teletherapy. So everything is all virtual. So 
you're not restricted to any particular location. So um, in essence, you know, teletherapy is wherever you are, as long as you have, um, you know, a mobile device or a laptop or, you know, a tab and you have internet connection, you can book a therapy session and a therapist will speak to you. So what we like to call it is that when you call the helpline, you know, considering that Nigeria has a pretty fair mobile penetration, we're really empowering everyday people who have a mobile phone to be able to access the care that they cannot ordinarily receive. I mean, we're looking at a country where we have, you have some statistics show about 250 psychiatrists to about 200 million people, or some other statistics are saying that is about 200 psychiatrists to you know um, over 200 million people. But we're looking at the population of people who actually have mental health conditions between 40 million to about 60 million, according wow. to the Federal Ministry of Health. So about 80 to 90 percent of people actually some statistics say about 91 percent of people will not get access to the mental health care that they oh need God. there is no standard mental health 81%. care across primary mm -hmm. health care centers in the whole of nigeria we're talking about over 600 primary health care centers and these are centers that are closest to home for majority of Nigerians, right? Then another statistic to look at is the fact that we're the poverty capital of the world. Mm. Over 60% of Nigerians live with multidimensional poverty. So mm. what we're doing at Your Rights Woman is saying these people would have next to zero chance of ever accessing mental health care at any given point in time over the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years if we have strong political will. So we can empower them by ensuring that with this you know, call, you can speak to a first responder. And those are who our trained counselors are. You know, you can talk to them as long as you want. You can, talk, you can call as frequently as you want to call. It's a 24-7 helpline. And if for any reason the line is choked up, you, you get a call back at any given point in time as well. You know, so people call and maybe that's when they are really contemplating. A lot of times when people call the helpline, they're still unsure. That's really what's going on. They're unsure. It's like, I'm not sure whether I should be seeking support or not. And one of the things I tell people is the moment you start to think that I don't know whether I should is exactly the time that you should. That is exactly the time you should begin to speak to somebody, a trusted person, a professional about your mental health. And so that is where we do first response. You de-escalate. So maybe when the person comes to you mentally, you're like the person is about eight or nine where they are. Maybe they're already having suicidal ideations. They've started thinking passively about ending their lives. Maybe they haven't gotten like, they haven't started to look like, okay, this is exactly how I can do it. So you try to talk to them using talk therapy to like really de-escalate. And if it's not as severe, maybe it's something that has to do with maybe an immediate life issue, I'm having struggles at work and it's just causing me sleepless nights, how do I do it? You can deploy things that have to do with like, you know, some coaching and some counseling skills as well, listening skills, you know, reassurance and things like that. However, if it goes too far in terms of eight, nine and all, we escalate to our therapists. So it's almost like you're going from, you know, um, a GP, a general practitioner, when you go to the doctor, to a specialist of some sort. You know, and then you go to the therapist and you, you, you are booked for a teletherapy session and then you have a one hour straight teletherapy session and it could even be more. And you can see the therapist or talk to the therapist well as often as you want. Maybe it's once a week, ideally, you know, and then we take it from there. A lot of times I have to say that we're working within a very dysfunctional healthcare system mm. in a more you know, advanced healthcare system, you know, incidences of, you know, suicide and things like that okay. would require us to maybe reach out to emergency services to quickly respond. But okay. a lot of times we have experienced bottlenecks in actually doing that. So as much as we talk to them on the phone, we try to de-escalate on the phone, there should be somebody on ground. So that's when we try to like get questions about, okay, where are you? Who is there? I will try to mobilize volunteer networks or find somebody who can go to the person's house to check on them, try to see if we can get them from their houses to the nearest, you know, healthcare facility and things like that. So it is, it is very difficult work, but we, we are doing the best we can considering. Is, that's very impressive. Very impressive. Well done, Awa. Thank you so much for that response. We're going to take a quick break. And once we get back, we'll have more questions for our guests. Um, I want to go back to what Hawa just disclosed. First and foremost, it was totally mind-numbing about the little amount of healthcare centers we have for mentally, ment mental illness, for patients of mental illness. But what I would like you to do, Hawa, especially, is to please announce at least a few numbers of the helplines so that our crew can either print it out whilst, you know, type it out whilst we're on air or put it, out, put it on towards the end of the show because a lot of people don't know who to call. Mm -hmm. They don't even know where to start. Mm -hmm. And as much as depression is considered to be an extremely 
you know, pre important predator of suicide. Only about 2% of severely depressed people eventually do die by suicide. So one of the most pressing approaches now is this issue of sniper. Like I was saying to Alatarora, I posted it and it really hits a few raw nerves. That's to show you how sensitive this issue is. NAVDAC reportedly put a ban on this pesticide. But sniper is just one of many objects and substances people use to commit suicide. You can jump over the bridge, you can cross the road and let the car hit you. Those who wish to end their lives can still do so. So please, as an advocate, I think it's extremely important that individuals, corporations, and indeed the government, not to mention NGO, should focus more on eradicating the factors responsible for the high rate of suicide and less on the means used in committing these acts. We should also focus, how do else do you think we can focus on decreasing the suicide of, the stigma of suicide, eradicate it and create more awareness? How are that for you? How do we, how do we fight the stigma? Yes, um, no, absolutely. Um, and I think we're doing it um, one way right now, which is begin to put the people who have the lived experience at the forefront to tell their stories. Um, I believe, and I, sh I mean, it's something that we believe at my organization, She Writes Women, um, the power of storytelling, the power of telling new stories um, about old things, um, going to the places where certain kinds of stories were told in the past and retelling those stories so that people can get reoriented about, you know, certain topics with regards to, yeah, you know, mental health conditions, suicide and things like that. I do believe that there is a lost value and resource when everybody talks over people that have had lived experience without having, having given them the opportunity to say, this is how I felt, this is what led me there, this is what I would have appreciated, this is what does not work for me, you know. So a lot of times I see the focus is actually on people themselves that, are, that have gone through suicidal ideations. But one thing I'll tell you for a fact is that people do not just wake up one day and decide, I yeah, want to exactly. end it all. I can tell you categorically that it is one of the toughest decisions that anybody can ever make. You know, and it's imagine. not a decision that is informed in the, in, the, in the right sense of it, in terms of, you know, just being informed. It is something that drives you to a point where you no longer see a way out. Mm, and so yes. it's almost mm. like, and I like to tell people, it's like suicide happens to you as opposed to you commit to suicide, you know. So I, I, I feel like there's a lot of reframing around it. And mm. we need to look broadly into the entire environment. So when we talk about eradication or prevention, what we should really be thinking about is the broader the broader picture. First off, we need to look at where we are in Nigeria, whether it's politically or economically. These are real factors. Every time we problem solve for mental health challenges, we, we, are, we are faced with the issue of poverty, unemployment, affordable yeah, housing, factors. Um, good, um, you know, all of those external factors that a lot of times, you know, are systemic in nature. Access to good quality health care, as close to home as possible, and things like that. And then we begin to come down to things that are a bit more cultural or things that are normative. So issues around shame, um, abuse, other social justice issues with regards to sexual violence. I'm a sexual violence survivor, and I tell people a lot, it's not about sex. What happens at mm. that time mm. changes the entire course of your life. It yeah. rewires your brain. It keeps you stuck in a loop. You know, so when we dismiss it and we tell the individual, oh, you need to get over it, or you need to like, you know, if you just talk like this and do like this, everything is going to be okay. We're losing out on an opportunity to actually change the entire environment. What is our criminal justice system like? Mm -hmm. There is healing in justice, and we rob a lot of people of the ability to properly heal when there is no justice for what has been done to them. And now they have to live with the consequences of what they didn't choose. And then everybody focuses on them to tell them, you'll be the one to move forward. You forgive you move on and things like that so i think it's really important that we look at the broader picture but then before we begin to chunk it down you know there are other signs that you know everyday people around the person can obviously look at and it, it depends it varies from person to person when you see people withdrawing that were formerly very social when you see people who you know used to be very talkative but now they're they are, they're holding back changes in eating and sleeping habits can be very very they, they it would usually cut across the board but when they speak about things there is a morbidness about how, how they speak. It's like there's no light at all. They can't see it. You know, and whilst you, you are saying that, well, we'll cope, we'll do this, they just can't see it. And they're like, I, I, I don't want to do this. What you about know, more you subtle start hearing signs? things like, I wish I wasn't alive, or... More subtle signs. Can we say that again? 
What about more subtle signs? Sorry to have broken into, into you while you were talking. More, more subtle signs that are not so obvious. What kind of signs do you look out for when they're yeah, not so um, obvious? Subtle signs could include things like wrapping up your affairs. And you know, some people will start giving away things. They don't want to acquire new things anymore because it feels like they're wrapping up. They, don't want, they no longer want to indulge anymore. They don't want to dream a new dream or set goals or aspire to anything. It's like, yep. It's very subtle because it looks like, well, maybe you're not too ambitious, you know, and things like that, but it is there. Uh, another subtle sign is maybe somebody who's very tidy, all of a sudden their hygiene deteriorates. Wow. It's also very subtle. A lot of times people are, are tagged, oh, you're lazy, you, you, you don't do this, you're not a responsible person. But really what is going on is a very classic depressive symptom that is really going on. I mean, I experienced it myself. So when people were coming and, you know, they're trying to like talk to me and come by, that's not really what I wanted. Just clean my environment and now feel better, you know. And so a lot of times I think uh, uh, there is so much lost if we can, that is the other people within the environment can, you know, change their intention from being the person that wants to save that person to being the person that wants to understand instead. You know, ask the person, what does support look like for you? Absolutely. You know, and mm. stay there and listen to, it's a very uncomfortable thing. I think a lot of times well we're trying to rush the process because it also makes us uncomfortable as well. Thank wow. you, Hawa. Wow. Hawa, do you want to give us the toll-free hotline yes, number yes, yes. before we ask Emmanuel yes. the next question? So, uh, so it can be, you know, it can be typed out. Absolutely. Please proceed. Yes. Please. Absolutely. Okay. So across Nigeria, 24-7, it is 0800-800-2000. Thank you so, so much So 0800-800-2000. Thank you, Hawa. Thank you for that. Emmanuel? You're both most yes. likely aware that... Tell the problem... No, no, you are both most likely aware that attempting suicide is a criminal offense in Nigeria under Section 327 of the Criminal Code Act, which states explicitly that any person who attempts to kill himself is guilty of a misdemeanor and is liable to imprisonment for one year. Here Only one year? <laughs> Only one year, B. <laughs> <laughs> Just no, so imagine. Sorry, suicide is liable to punishment for one year. Prison. Oh, prison. prison. Oh, my God. Not only one year. How Somebody is going through someone? suicide, and they will send them oh to prison on top of the trauma they're already going through. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> Hearing this alone is very excruciating. Yet, we have actual stories of depressed, hopeless victims locked up in Nigerian prisons for attempting suicide. Hawa or Emmanuel, let's start with Emmanuel. What do you want to say to Nigeria's lawmakers right now in advocating for urgent reform? Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, first of all, I would uh, advise the Nigerian lawmakers to actually, um, before making any of those laws, like they should actually collaborate with uh, individuals, maybe persons who have suffered such experiences or agencies who, who are working towards tackling these issues because most of those persons who kind of make, make the laws and all that, like they, they really don't have the experience or what it looks like, you know, to be, to be, to suffer maybe suicide or to suffer suicide attempts or something related to that. So I think this laws has to be reviewed and it should be like a collaborative effort and, you know, like bringing together different stakeholders, persons who are concerned about this issue. Yeah. And anyway, Emmanuel, I'm glad that you've drawn attention to this. When I was telling my co-host only one year, I was actually being very sarcastic. Sarcastic, of so course. Just of in course case our viewers get <laughs> misconstrued my, my attempt. And the earlier the, the earlier the government and the, the, the authorities begin to understand the severity of this problem, mm -hmm. the better that they address it. And we are hoping that this also would attract viewers and those in the Senate and those in the House of Rep that can pass bills to ensure that this thing is given the attention mm -hmm. it is, is needed and is much required. I, I admire the both of you. I mean, last week I never were saying it, that we admire your courage. Absolutely. We admire the fact that you could come out. How are Is it okay Emmanuel? if I just add something to, yes, please do. you know? Please do. Please do. Please your viewpoint to the lawmakers. Please go yes. ahead. Um, please do. 
Yes, so um, in the advocacy work since 2018, we have worked at high levels to ensure that, you know, the mental health bill that was, that has been, they have tried to pass a mental health bill for mm -hmm. over a decade. And so this time around, there was a mental health bill that didn't quite reach the standards of international human rights. And this is what the issue is. The issue is that we think that people with mental health conditions are, we look at the issue of mental health as it's us versus them. It is those people. But when we begin to realize and look at mental health as a general health concern, and that's why mm -hmm. you know, when you talked about suicide being a public health concern, I was nodding because that is really what it is. Everybody has a mental health. Now, whether it is to a point where people call illness or disorder or what I prefer to call a mental health condition or a psychosocial disability um, is a different conversation entirely. But every single Nigerian should have access to quality mental health care as they should have access to every other kind of health care. So what we're done at that time is that we looked at the bill and we made a presentation at the National Assembly and I'm proud to say that I was the first person with a mental health condition to um, testify on the floor of the National Assembly oh, in that capacity, on that. you know, to speak on, on the rights of people, thank you very much, um, to speak on the rights of people with mental health conditions and so that bill was stepped down and reformed. So the bill is still going through the process and, um, you know, it's hopefully going to be assented to. But one of the things that we always stand for is the, the crux of the disability movement, which is nothing about us without us. You do not create a law, you do not create a policy, mm -hmm. you do not champion mental health causes without people who actually mm -hmm. live with mental health conditions championing okay. it, without us being at the table, not as just a service user or a tokenistic one chair on the table, is that we have lost significant resource in terms of always thinking that we know what to be done about people with mental health conditions, like we're charity projects. We are actually subjects of rights. We have things we love, we have passions, we have ambitions and things like that. So it is important that, you know, there isn't that gap in what we do. Anyway. Um, there is a bill and that would hopefully also criminalize suicide as well. And as well as, you know, all of those other things, um, d d there is a lot of collaboration that needs okay. to be done and a lot of capacity building in terms of reorienting, you Absolutely. know, the people Thank in the right Thank you places. so much, Howard. Thank you. We're so and it's obvious, that, it's obvious that we're going to have her again because <laughs> there's just so much to talk about. And I can feel your passion. And Both it is you. that passion mm -hmm. that will give hope to the whole place. By the time we have people like yourself and Emmanuel coming forth and lending your voice to this act, it's a step in the right direction. Absolutely. And inch is better than a mile in the right direction. So thank you so much for thank being with us this morning. So that's all we have time for today. You've been watching Perspectives here on Arise News with me, Ruth Osime. And remember, life is a learning curve. And with me, Ola Terera Majekudumi Oniru. Thank you for watching Perspectives. See you again next week.